at uh, Delmahoy near Edinburgh, July 22, 1765. Now, Dr. Martin was known to live in London, uh, so I the tone of my voice partially reflects this may be a little unusual, a little bit interesting, but it may lead to something that's yet to be answered. Okay. Sir, I desire you will send me two lists of the Royal Society for this year, and write me the names of the members that have been elected since that list was printed. <coughs> I would likewise be glad to know the result of Mr. Canton's experiments. I'm not sure who that is. I wish I knew all the background. I wish I was an expert in British history. I'm not. Um, I'm very good at doing research, though. And so eventually, if I really wanted to find out who Mr. Canton was, I would find out. Um, I'm apt to think that they will answer in the way he described, though my experience will rather show it to a greater certainty but that must be deferred until I return to London, your humble certain servant, Morton. And I'm thinking, well, why would the Earl of Morton... I, I, I know Benjamin Franklin on many occasions would, and of course Benjamin Franklin was an entitled individual, and on many occasions would use the, the language, your humble, affectionate servant, things of that nature back then. It almost seemed like it's someone writing in today's age very truly yours but you know, someone you know in a business correspondence they have no affection for but at the same time um, I don't know I'm just kind of wondering whether if the Earl of Morton wrote that is there a difference would he use a different closing because he was the Earl of Morton and if not then maybe this was somebody else but we're not too sure Okay, now this is titled as to the Earl of Morton at Edinburgh. We don't know what the assumption was of the person that wrote this. My Lord, this is written at the Royal Society House, August 1st, 1765, addressing someone as uh, being addressed as my Lord. Now it seems, in that case, the flip side of that, it seems a little bit haughty of, and of of addressing someone that is not titled, as far as I know, Dr. Morton. Anyway, let's let's get on to this. Let's get on with this. To the committee for examining Mr. Canton's experiments. We've met four times, the six, the sixth instant, and what that means, the sixth day of the month. So that would have, uh, probably would have been uh, October 6, 1765, at which meeting your lordship was partially present and on the 9th, 12th, and 23rd of October and they talk of another meeting before they <coughs> break up. The attendants have been Lord Charles Cavendish, Dr. Franklin, Watson, Heverdon, and Mr. Ellicott. Yeah, Benjamin Franklin was definitely still living even when the Constitution was written. He was living and for a while. He, Dr. Franklin was in London. There is a Franklin house. I don't know the exact years, right? And it seemed to me Franklin was more involved in being a printer in London than being, uh, well, he did some scientific work. Uh, but again, I'm not expert enough to sort out ex <coughs> exactly, oh, that's too early or that's too late. They have measured and weighed, but it sounds like something Dr. Franklin would do. They measured and weighed the balls. The tubes made all the preparatory experiments. Seemed to uh, be convinced of the truth of the proposition, but the gentlemen here to, uh, hitherto met appear all friends to the experiments, which I doubt whether there will not arise some contest, especially as the experiments are of too great a nicety to be immediately conclusive. Your lordship's proposed experiment will certainly demonstrate it, whether pro or con, with precision and satisfactory as being made in a larger field. <coughs> Okay, let's just keep going here. Um, now there's more of these like this. They pretty much are going to be the same kind of deal here. There's one that had some very interesting ver verbiage. It's still being termed Lord Morton, and there's one that is identified as actually being with Dr. Charles Morton. Here's a little snippet. Unfortunately, the doctor forgot to date it. Something about a Fahrenheit thermometer. But again, written to the Earl of Morton. Someone wanting a list of all the people that were actually titled and members of the Royal Society. And now here it is, letters to and from Dr. Charles Morton. 
and it's got him again at, at, at Leicesterfields. And this is in actually 1751, so this is before he actually joined up with the society. To Dr. Charles Morton Leicesterfield, sir, this is written from Adams Court in Broad Street, July 1st, 1751. So this is. Six months before he joined the Royal Society, and this may have been <laughs> a key moment. <laughs> and the result of this may have helped him, you know, make something out of himself uh, more than just being a doctor, but also a scientist. Demonstrate that he was more than just a doctor. You having been so good as to promise me your assistance to collect some fossils for me and make the observations on the fossil kingdom in the counties of Westmoreland and Lancashire, I take the liberty to trouble you with the following notes relating to those counties to make the inquiries and collect the fossils specified if possible. For Westmoreland, there are many lead mines in Westmoreland. Now, now let's just stop here. The person that wrote this, I'm just going to jump ahead here, was Mr. DaCosta. And Mr. DaCosta seems to be educating Dr. Morton about Westmoreland, even though he was a native there. Now, we know he practiced uh, medicine at Kendall, uh, and he was married and had his first daughter, but not six years prior, if I remember the year right, 1745. So his daughter actually would have been six at about the time. And it basically goes into a lot of geographical detail about various things here. <coughs> and this was written at Beerbinder Lane, July, June 4th, 1759. The bear here, though, is my esteemed friend. No, that's still Mr. DaCosta. So where is Mr. Morton? Okay, dear Mr. DeCasa, this is January 20th, 1764. To, this is now after he's a member of the Royal Society. I've perused you. It's quite a while, actually. When did this start? 1751. God, 13 years. Okay. Um, I've perused your papers and now return them that you may complete the matter ordered by the council, which relates only to the copies of the journal, not the original minutes, which is quite another consideration which I shall examine myself. Upon the face of your account, the deficiency stands thus. Volume 19 and 2 restored to its place. Copies of the journals deficient from November 30, 1748, exclusive, to December 5, 1751, also exclusive, being three years or one volume. Also from June 5, 1760, blah, blah, blah. Okay, various volumes are, are copying about. You see then that a supposition the 20th volume or from November 30, 1748 to December 25th being lost or not copied, and that none of those subsequent to June 5th, 1760 are copied. There were only six, not 12 years deficient on the face of your account. <coughs> I believe therefore, therefore it will be best for me to come to the society and examine myself, which I'll do on Monday next at 12 o'clock. I also and you will be so good as to engage Mr. Peter Curson to meet me at that time. I should be glad to get a fair copy of the original papers, books, and minutes of the closet. I have enclosed the minutes of the council to be entered fair. Yours truly, uh, Charles Morton. <coughs> and that's pretty much it. Yeah, there's a Charles Morris. they got a very strange indexing in this thing. So I'm not quite sure... <laughs> Not much there. <clears throat> okay, this is a booklet has to do with the Foundling Hospital from 1771, and this was um, this is page five of it. It's on Google Books. This is all it really appears. And here are some people that are on the general committee. And right here on page eight, there's a Charles Morton M.D. and a John Morton. Esquire. You can barely make those out <coughs> on that scan. That's just him being on the board of or involved some way with the Foundling Hospital. It's an alphabetical list. Here's some Pratt's. <laughs> I, I also highlight any name that I thought was interesting. 
Now, there's a John Morton Esquire of Lincoln Inn Fields. And um, this also lists him in, as of 1771 as uh, being one of the physicians to the hospital and living at Montague House, which is where uh, Lady, Mo Lady Montague, the Lady of the Blue Stockings, lived for a while that he moved into subsequently and had subsequently been named Savile House. And then here's Sir George Savile. This would be, um, if I got that right, it's got to be the, the, uh, his son-in-law. Uh, the son of Mary Pratt and George Savile, because the senior had already died. <coughs> so you can see not everybody here was, well, just not everybody here was <coughs> at some kind of Esquire <laughs> connected to, to their name. Exactly who, who they were and what they did, I'm not exactly clear on, but anyway, you can get this out of Google Books too. Okay, and then the next thing. Now this is, I have since, I wrote in my article that Charles Morton was the author of this, but, um, you know, I, <coughs> it's kind of like uh, me proving he was born in 1716, can I really prove it? Now, I do know that, and I'm just going a little bit into some of the things his, his grandson Pierce Morton did. And some of the things that were said about earlier generations of Mortons that I have cannot prove any connection between Dr. Morton and them, but I have a feeling that there is a connection. And uh, this also, me believing there is a connection, is counter to my so far conclusion that Charles Carr Morton was not the natural son of Dr. Morton. I said too much? Okay, I hope I haven't. Okay, so. Pierce Morton wrote a um, article on Dandelion Spears. I don't even know what a Dandelion Spear is myself. I'm just a simple accountant that knows how to add rational numbers on a trial balance, and I know that I've done the math wrong if debits don't equal credits. That's about... Well, I could add things pretty fast in my head. Um, for the most part... Um, by no means am I any kind of advanced math whiz bang. It was the bane of my high school, so keep that in mind. But anyway, it is also said of um, an earlier Charles Morton that ended up leaving uh, to be a priest in Boston. It was a learned man, and actually, um, uh, even though he was a minister or was religious, tried to educate other people more like a modern school than uh, at least what I heard about in, or what I've read about even of, of Yale University in colonial times. One of my ancestors was the first president of Yale. His name was Abraham Pearson. So I did a little bit of reading about what they would do and their main focus in even some of those early, earlier colonial schools, although yeah, it's about, about the same time uh, was just a <laughs> If you graduated from from Yale back then, you were just a qualified priest. In the times you lived in, you weren't uh, some kind of a advanced academia, so to speak. Although you you probably did get some academic teaching with it, the focus was the purpose was was to educate the individual to be ready to lead a congregation. Maybe I should 